whenever there is a step change in productivity brought about by any kind of technology, uh, and that usually emerges in science, but let's just say technology, when 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 there is a productivity improvement that can be gained through technology, which is of an order of magnitude better than what was there before, we find that society shift uh, and uh, economics shifts in that direction, and it has a profound impact. So. Uh, I can give you examples of what we've lived through in our own lifetimes, right? Uh, so uh, we have had the internet uh, come into the world, right? And I come from India, which was and was a developing country, and uh, I've seen the internet transform uh, that country in less than two decades, right? Uh, and, and and it's a visible transformation in in many senses. Uh, and the things that were valid at the start of the internet are not valid right now. So we are in a different stage of maturity when it comes to the internet itself as a common social tool or technology that everyone can access. Uh, the same is going to happen also uh, with AI. Hello and welcome to Better Societies, where we explore how societal theories and disruptive technologies are used to create utopic or dystopic outcomes impacting global powers and our global lives. In this presentation, we're speaking with Arvind Iyer to understand how technological innovation cycles drive economic shifts and shape investment opportunities. Arvind Iyer is a distinguished data science and AI executive, a 40 under 30, 40 data scientist of 2023, and holds an MBA from the Said Business School at the University of Oxford, achieved through a full scholarship. He also has degrees in electronics engineering and law. He has collaborated with 50 plus Fortune 1000 firms over the years and contributed to social impact businesses as an AI advisor and technologist. Presently, Arvin serves as the Director of Technology AI at Springer Nature Group, where he leads an AI labs and an AI engineering team. He successfully built an AI center of excellence for a renowned academic publisher, built the tech stacks for multiple firms, and delivered award-winning projects showcasing his adeptness in navigating complex AI, machine learning, data science landscapes at executive levels. He's actively contributing insights on AI, leadership, management, technology, and data science. A couple key points to keep in mind is that Arvin is most known for helping enterprises leverage cutting edge developments in AI ML and deliver high impact interventions within their value chain. Today, we'll be sharing the exact same frameworks that Arvin used with hundreds of executives to understand and quickly take advantage of developments in AI without being sidetracked by the hype and noise. And something about Arvin that really impressed me is his ability to think about the big picture, identify the macroeconomic patterns, and zoom into the details of how new disruptive technologies work and affect society's innovations, economies, and policies. So in this presentation, Arvin will explore the intricate relationship between technological innovation cycles and the profound impact on economic cycles, research, and policy. Delving into this dynamic interaction, the discussion will unveil, the discussion will unveil how technological advancements drive pivotal shifts in economic landscapes, shape research trajectories, and influence policy formulations. Listeners can expect a deep dive into the interconnected realms of technological innovation and economic cycles. Arvin will explain how these innovation cycles significantly influence the ebbs and flows of economies worldwide. Moreover, he will dissect the ways in which research and policy decisions are steered and molded by the continuous evolution of technology. The episode will encompass a comprehensive analysis of historical and contemporary instances, showcasing how technological breakthroughs impact significant disruptions in economic cycles. Arvin will illustrate the impact of these disruptions on various sectors and how they catalyze paradigm shifts in research and policy initiatives. At the conclusion of the session, you'll walk away with a profound understanding of how technological innovation cycles intricately interplay with economic cycles, shaping market dynamics for both entrepreneurs and investors, insights into historical and modern instances where technology-induced disruptions have altered economic landscapes and influenced research and policy directions, practical strategies to harness the knowledge of technological innovation cycles for identifying and seizing future market opportunities, guidance on utilizing this understanding to inform strategic decision-making in investment and entrepreneurial endeavors. And then armed with these insights, listeners will be empowered to navigate and capitalize on the evolving economic and technological landscapes. Again, a deeper comprehension of how these cycles interconnect and impact research policy formulations and market dynamics, enhancing their capacity to 
platform decisions in their respective fields. So Arvind Iyer, welcome to Better Society. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you for having me over and for the warm introduction and happy to be here. Awesome. So first off in your own words, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and what you're currently working on? Sure. So uh, I have about uh, one and a half decades of experience in AI, machine learning, data science, and broadly systems engineering. Uh, my background is essentially electronics and instrumentation engineering, uh, while I've also studied the law, and I also have an MBA uh, from the University of Oxford. Uh, my interest in AI and machine learning uh, evolved through a series of progressions, which I can walk you through as we go through the presentation. And part of the motivation for this talk emerged from my experience in the field. So I started off primarily in the engineering domain. And over the years, I've seen the application of those uh, engineering principles evolve and eventually become something that is useful at an enterprise level. So uh, this talk is mostly around collecting some of the ideas that have shaped my thinking around uh, some of these technological developments and how I see this uh, evolving over the next few decades. Awesome. So, thank you. Just, yeah. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about how your work can benefit the different entrepreneurs, executives, investors, researchers, and activists that want to help create better societies? Sure. I think uh, broadly, this this goes down to the root of my uh, the thesis of this talk. I think the idea here is. Whenever there is a step change in productivity brought about by any kind of technology, uh, and that usually emerges in science, but let's just say technology, when 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 there is a productivity improvement that can be gained through technology, which is of an order of magnitude better than what was there before, we find that society shift uh, and uh, economics shifts in that direction, and it has a profound impact. So. Uh, I can give you examples of what we've lived through in our own lifetimes, right? Uh, so uh, we have had the internet uh, come into the world, right? And I come from India, which was and was a developing country. And uh, I've seen the internet transform uh, that country in less than two decades, right? Uh, and, and and it's a visible transformation in, in many senses. Uh, and the things that were valid at the start of the internet are not valid right now. So we are in a different stage of maturity when it comes to the internet itself as a common social tool uh, or technology that everyone can access. Uh, the same is going to happen also uh, with AI. Uh, the reason being that AI is not a tool, right? AI is uh, essentially the application of a certain set of thinking principles to processes and business problems. So when you take that kind of approach to, uh, to deploying artificial intelligence in a productive way, you realize that uh, it's always about productivity improvements. And the historical logic of this goes, goes right down to Adam Smith, right? So when we go to Adam Smith and when he proposed uh, the division of labor, the whole thesis that he had with respect to the pin factory, so he wrote this book on analyzing a pin factory, and he realized that having a specialist who is an expert at, at building these horse pins, so at that time, people used to travel around in horse carriages, so you needed these specialist pins and that was a pretty complicated process. So people had to make those pins and they used to be master blacksmiths uh, in that era. And there were all these small shops that used to have these specialists who were doing it for many years. Uh, and when Adam Smith walked in, he realized that if he could break down that process of making a pin and he broke it down into 16 discrete steps. And when he was able to allocate resources to those 16 different steps, he was able to achieve a productivity improvement that was uh, several thousand times the, the output that was there when only one specialist was doing it with a bunch of apprentices, right? Wow. So it was the same, it was the same set of, uh, it was the same shop floor, it was the same process, but by making a few alterations to the process, right? Uh, he was able to essentially get productivity improvements that were phenomenal and astounding, and which still is the bedrock of modern sort of management thinking, right? Uh, AI hits that problem at a fundamental level, right? AI al allows you to uh, reimagine that particular reordering uh, when you really understand its application. And so when when you're going to be able to apply something as tremendous as that at such a fundamental place in, in, in business value chains, right? That is the fundamental definition, I think, of uh, even entrepreneurship, right? So uh, I think it was Jean-Baptiste Say who gives us the first definition of entrepreneur. And he says, 
an entrepreneur is someone who adds value in a value chain, right? So someone who's able to take a value chain and add value to that value chain is an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter what you call this person, uh, but that's essentially the definition we all work with. And AI does exactly that. AI is essentially the tool uh, that helps you engineer exactly that. So I think uh, it's it's well rooted in theory. It's well rooted in in the science. It's well rooted in many many decades of established management thinking. And now this is a this is a tool that will go into business engineering, right? And, and fundamentally, uh, I see this as something that will reshape how enterprises evolve uh, eventually. So um, how how long will that take, and what shape will that take? That remains to be seen. But uh, Looking at historical trends, we do know that these things do do happen. They take their own time. We are we maybe wrong about predicting when it will happen, but there is a there is a substantial amount of theory to back this up. Can we uh, briefly explain also what we mean when we say innovation cycles, and then we'll dive into your presentation? Of course. So uh, there's there's this whole concept of a business cycle, right? And uh, this is a concept that's about 160 years old. So. Uh, there's a lot of historic uh, historical context to how we've come to define the concept of a business cycle and consequently other sorts of cycles, right? Innovation cycles or technological cycles. So it all start it all starts with the idea that there is cyclicity in in uh, in patterns and uh, some things repeat. Maybe not in the same form, but there are certain patterns and certain principles that we see constantly recurring in in. Uh, in societies, right, or in economics, or in in many areas. So there's always been an interest, I think, to find patterns, uh, and that's what we pretty much try to do in science as well. And the idea of these cycles emerges from there. So the idea that we can superimpose a mathematical curve to explain these natural phenomenon is a, a very old mathematical idea. And there are many fields of mathematics that try to uh, to try and decipher and get meaning out of this. So. Uh, the, there are fields of descriptive statistics, there's number theory, there is graph theory, there's a number of theories of, uh, I mean, there's a number of areas of mathematics that try to give meaning to data and try to superimpose curves and try to give you a sense of what is happening. So cycles emerge from there. Uh, and uh, are they real or are they not is a debate uh, that that is enduring still in many areas. In some areas, it's it's accepted that they, they do exist. In some other areas, the jury's out. But again, we can dive into that during the presentation, and hopefully that'll give you a little more context uh, around some of these uh, debates that shape this, right? That shape this narrative. Excellent. Okay, so go ahead and share your screen. Let's dive in. All right. Well, let me... Great. Can you see my screen? Is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So. Uh, essentially, I just want to, again, quickly just go to the motivations for the stock. So uh, when I started off my career back in 2010, uh, my first job was in uh, was in instrumentation engineering. Right? So we were working with a lot of manufacturing units, and there was a lot of uh, sensors that were used. Right? And these are really, again, age-old technologies uh, that have been around for a very, very long time. So these, these are systems like SCADA, DCS. These are really old systems, and these, th these things tend to generate a large volume of data. And a lot of these units, even today, in a lot of manufacturing units and a lot of companies around the world, you have people who are sitting and looking at screens all the time and looking to react and uh, looking to basically monitor these these uh, these volumes of data and this operational data that comes in. Uh, and consequently, because this volume of data was not being analyzed, it was an obvious opportunity. And it was obvious to me, uh, and it was obvious to everybody, actually. Everybody in the sector knew at that point in time that, okay, there are these huge volumes of data that are getting generated. A, we don't know how to bring it to some place where we can do some kind of analysis on it, and B, we don't even know how to analyze it. So that was the scenario uh, when I was uh, when I was just starting out uh, in in back in 2010. And since then, I think over the years, uh, I think pretty much over the last 14 years, there's been a remarkable set of improvements uh, in the underlying infrastructure, and, and I think all of us are beneficiaries of it today. Uh, but I've been able to, I've been lucky and fortunate enough to see the evolution of the cloud. Uh, and the whole transition from on-premise infrastructure to something that is being managed as a service uh, off-premise. And then there was also another, a lot of other enabling libraries, enabling languages and abstractions that, that truly have improved uh, over the last uh, 14 to 15 years. So it's it's improved remarkably. So you've had foundational languages like Python, uh, R, Julia, and then you have something called infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. So all of these offerings have emerged 
uh, over the last 15 years, and they've really enabled new ways of delivering value. And I think everybody recognizes that the way to build software and deliver it at scale over the last 15 years has had a transformational shift, uh, which is nothing like how things were getting built, say, at the start of the 20, 2000s, right? So the whole shift is very, very obvious, and the barriers to entry have also become quite, uh, quite, quite low. So it's, again, created a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs, for investors. Uh, and again, one of the advantages of having been associated with this area for uh, about 15 years has been that uh, I've been lucky enough to see uh, and experience the hype at the center of it for a bunch of periods. So because I came from uh, a electronics engineering background, so that took me straight away into data engineering, data management, and then eventually that took me into data science and algorithms and how do we get value out of this, and that eventually took me into data storytelling. And over this 14 years, I've been fortunate enough to see hypes in in the sectors that I've been able to work in. So I was I was very much there when uh, the word cloud got introduced, uh, and I was I was I was fortunate enough to be there when big data became like a trend, uh, and data science got got defined uh, and it became like a thing. And now you have decision scientists, data scientists. So you have all of these terms and terminologies that are trying to explain these new job job functions that are uh, job titles that are being created to manage this new capabilities, right? Then again, there was the GPT era, which was quite active even before chat GPT became a thing, but it's still something that uh, that that was quite well known even within the analytics space per se. Uh, and then now you have the Gen AI era as well. So fortunate enough to have seen about five different uh, uh, proper hypes within the areas that I was, I was able to work in. So that again, gave me a sense of where did the hype die down? Where, were the, where was the real value uh, that was enduring? what expectations were still not realized and uh, what still had to come to pass, right? So I was, I think some, those were the motivations from the tech side. Uh, but uh, I also realized that uh, as a person who's trying to navigate and, and make a career in this field, uh, I need to understand the economics. There was no way around uh, uh, understanding the idea that the tech is deeply connected to the economics. And uh, as the technology evolved, the economics evolved. And as the economics evolved, a new technological capability suddenly got realized uh, with all these different hype cycles that that happened over the last uh, few few years, and uh, we we I've noticed that a lot of engineering departments in a lot of cases they have had repeated phases of having to start from the ground floor. So they they built something and they didn't junk everything and go back to something else because it just became so valuable to throw away what you've built. You've invested in a bunch of stuff. Uh, and you've built it to a certain point, and you would expect that, okay, this makes sense to invest further, but suddenly this new technological uh, innovation comes out of the blue, which orders a order, like a factor leap in magnitude change, right, in terms of, like, it is much more profitable to shift. So th that has happened several times, and we've had costs break down, and there's been a race to the bottom in several parts of the sector uh, in the enabling layer uh, a lot of times, right? and we continue to see that as, as we see improvements uh, even right at the chip level, right? Uh, but what it also gave me a sense was there is a need to have a systematic framework that will enable people, these new job titles that are being that have been created over the last 14, 15 years and, and are still being created and we're nowhere near uh, we're nowhere near correctly identifying the roles and the requirements of these personnel who need to come into this era, right? We are nowhere near having a systematic framework for that. Uh, and that is still something that is getting evolved around the world. And all of these job titles are evolving. But that's that's exactly where we are. We were at the start of something that is going to fundamentally reshape a lot of things, right? New job titles, new ways of working, new tooling, uh, new many things. And the, the big question around all of this is, how do you prepare for change? So there's going to be a bunch of changes that are happening. There's, there's changes that happen. So how do you prepare for this, right? And uh, so I realized that I had to go into history. And uh, the, the historical, re I mean, the reason why I had to go into history was because while AI is new, technology per se is not new, and new technology has is not a new phenomenon. So uh, when I had to uh, dig a little deeper, I realized that presenting this is going to be helpful probably to make your own analysis and predictions, and I'm going to try and keep this talk grounded in data and try to steer it away from the hype and give you a sense of what is real and what, what may or may not happen. And I can also give you a sense of uh, a comparison, right? like what, what happens with the hype in just one or two years because of the space and how quickly it's moving. Uh, and uh, knowing or at least having some sense of which parts of a hype cycle might persist and which might fade away. So getting a sense of where do we focus on what is important rather than getting distracted by the next great application toy or something like that, right? Uh, so, or at, at least understanding 
what is profoundly important as opposed to what is uh, what is I think marginally important. I think that's something that I would like to do. And like I said, I, I think I've always subscribed to this view that data scientists, data engineers, the people who are emerging in this particular space, which is still being defined, and in people might uh, might disagree with me saying that it is well defined. Uh, I would disagree with them because uh, I think uh, having seen the sector in a bunch of countries now, I can tell you that it is not. The roles are not defined, uh, and there is definite gaps in terms of recognizing expertise, recognizing the different new, new skills that are required here. So I feel that this new sector, it is it is actually on the people within the space to go and educate the business about all of the different complexities and all of the different requirements that are needed. And so they need to also understand the language of business. So they need to engage with business. They need to engage with economics and vice versa. The folks in business and economics need to understand uh, how this is not just hype, right? And what is the real parts of this that is just going to, uh, that that is real and what is not going to, what's probably something that needs to still be borne out by evidence. Uh, so this is a little bit about my background. Uh, and I think you've covered this part, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip this and just get into uh, what is the current enterprise situation today, right? To give you a sense of where we are uh, and then talk about where we go from there, right? So right now, like before chat GPT, what was the situation when we talk about enterprise AI? So a lot of a lot of companies have always had AI ML departments or departments of analytics, or you can, they call it different names over the years, but there's always been something that is, that is related to managing information systems and uh, presenting that data in a manner that adds value. So extracting the insights out of information and delivering that value, that's always there, there's always a need. Uh, as the tooling has evolved, you're now calling it different things. But the the core situation before the emergence of ChatGPT in, in uh, November 22, uh, is that the first thing was the value proposition itself was unclear. When you talk about AI at the, at the broad level, it was never very clear what the true value proposition was. So people never knew how to judge these initiatives. So either they succeed or they not, but it was never rooted in something that was tangible and you never knew how to assess, uh, even though there's a whole body of literature around it. Uh, and there's a recurrent problem that is still faced today that a lot of these initiatives never scaled into production uh, and the everyday entrepreneur just never understood what is, what is this whole deal and what is going on. So these people were talking about LSTMs and all of these weird uh, terminologies around the world and nobody was like, what, what what is this, right? So it was a basic challenge for many people uh, and the whole idea of data engineering. So while management theory has always had a great deal of respect for data and for a data-driven decision thinking, uh, the whole idea of data engineering as a discipline was, was not very, very clear. It's still probably not very clear where we're not very sure why are we investing in data engineering? Right? What is the true uh, value addition out of it? So right now, or even then, even then more so, uh, now of course the situation is changing and people are becoming more and more aware. But then it was more about, this is an abstract area. We have no idea uh, what this is about. We're investing into it, we're getting these data engineers. But it, to to pinpoint and say, what is the value added by them has always been a challenge, right? Uh, before the chat GPT era. Uh, and a lot of questions uh, that was going on back then was mostly around, at the data layer. It was not about the AI or the analytics layer. A lot of the focus was about, look at the quality of the data. There are governance problems with that data. How do we get all of this data? Do we know which data do we have? So all of the fundamental questions around what do we have were unresolved, right? So right at that, so because of that, value propositions had uh, a lot of challenges. There was also the problem of complexity. So simple analytics is relatively easier, even though it is complex when you have large data sets, but it's relatively easier to work with. But uh, when you want to start showcasing slightly more, more complicated models, uh, and that becomes a big challenge to both build, develop, implement, and, and showcase the value, but also operationalize and explain and get the adoption. And that those are things that always have had problems. So these were always seen to be R&D spends and not very clear uh, what's the value, right? So the most obvious thing that you would see uh, when it came down to how these things were consumed is dashboards. So a lot of the pre chat GPT era, the output of many of these analytics and AI engagements was always seen to be a dashboard or a web app or a UI where you go in and you see a bunch of numbers and figures going up and down. And that was pretty much the scope of what you can do. Like it, it was uh, the best that you could think of. Uh, and there was a lot of other things that were going on, right? So the whole idea of, because of this complexity, because of the unclear value proposition, uh, like I said, you had a pretty restricted space uh, which which had which struggled a lot in terms of scale 
in terms of getting people to buy in, in terms of being able to invest in these complicated infrastructure or complicated investments when a lot of low-hanging fruit was still available for businesses uh, before the chat GPT era. I mean, there, there was still low-hanging fruit. You could work, you could focus on investing in workforce, in uh, in like more more marketing spend, more advertising spend. So you could try to get the marginal utility of spending more in like traditional ways of generating value as opposed to going and exploring this whole new paradigm uh, out of the blue, right? So it was still making sense uh, uh, at that point. Uh, but now things have changed. Like, uh, and uh, the question is how much have they changed? Uh, you can you can make the argument that not not significantly so because while the tech has shifted definitely in a certain direction, the workforce has not caught up. So the world has not reacted uh, fast enough. Uh, so the tech is now really fast and it's it's really far ahead, right? And the world has not caught up with it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, people are not going to be able to bridge that gap with opportunities. And that's what's going to happen now. So people are going to play catch up and you're going to see people trying to bridge that gap. Right? Uh, but once we talk about this whole, what is strategy predicting? So we are going to have to talk about the hype. And for that, the best, the most emblematic thing to talk about is Gartner. So Gartner has published this hype cycle for many years, a very respected tool, which has been used by a lot of people to analyze the state of the industry, or at least it's a good snapshot of what the industry thinks at that particular point in time uh, when, when this particular survey is taken. So just to give you a sense of what, how quickly these things change, right? And how, and, and the dynamism of the sector. I'm going to point to you this particular Gartner slide, which is from 2021, just two years ago. Uh, uh, so in 2021, Gartner says generative AI, uh, which is at the start, it's not nowhere near the peak of inflation. And this is quite prescient if you think about it. It's before chat GPT. They say that it's going to take about two to five years before we reach a plateau of productivity. So they expected the, uh, the generative AI to hype pretty soon and then quickly go into a trough of disillusionment and then reach a plateau of productivity uh, within two to five years. So they expected this hype to play out uh, in the next two to five years. And they, were, they had good reasons to say this. Like they had GPT-3 at that time. It was available for a lot of people uh, who knew how to get it. And while it was not available at the public level, there were many apps that leveraged GPT-3 at the back end that were available to people in different, different businesses or different parts of the businesses. Uh, but that was a prediction that they had made right, two years ago. Uh, and just to contrast what what that prediction is very recently, which is in 2023, uh, just two years later, they have now placed generative AI right at the peak of the life cycle. Uh, and now, if you notice, the, they've marked it as it will reach its plateau five to 10 years later. So they've marked the generative AI right at the top of the dark blue. And they are now claiming that it is going to be another five to 10 years before Generative AI goes through this trough of disillusionment, goes through the slope of enlightenment, and reaches uh, the plateau of productivity. Now, and Arvind, do you mind just breaking down each of these phases uh, and what they mean? Sure. So this particular curve is a very famous uh, technological curve that got famous uh, over the last three decades. So it was uh, it's basically called the technological S curve, and this is a, a play on that particular S curve. So the idea is that every technological uh, product or every every technology specifically, it starts off with something that triggers the innovation. So there's this start of it where you have these early adopters and then they have this chasm. So you see these small bars over here, these small white gaps. So there is this chasm that you have to cross each time. And once you cross every chasm, you're going to go into these different uh, phases. So once you cross the first chasm, you, you basically reach something called the peak of inflated expectations. So the product has now gotten a bunch of early adopters. They're really enthusiastic about it. They then bring on a bunch of uh, regular users. The regular users get in with the product. They Then they are really disappointed with the product and they, they are uh, upset with it. And then at some point in time, they realize that, no, it's not as bad as what they thought. There is still some utility in it. And then they come down to a more measured sense of uh, what is useful and what is not. Right. So that's what that is the sort of mental... Uh, mind map I would give you to interpret this particular S curve, uh, and a very very good example of this uh, is just is basically Galactica. Uh, so Galactica was a released by Facebook just a few a couple of, in fact the same month uh, as when Chat GPT was released, and many people might not remember Galactica, but uh, it was the product that actually in many ways was the precursor to Chat GPT. I'm a huge fan of that uh, particular product when it released because it was live and lived on the internet for a glorious four days or three days. 
but when it lasted, while it lasted, the impact it had was just phenomenal. Like the product went in, people were using it, they were starting to watch it generate code, exactly what ChatGPT does, right? not very different. It just didn't have guardrails. Uh, OpenAI did because they had the whole experience of running GPT-3 uh, in beta and in private for a while. So uh, their product was really great, but people were much more welcoming of chat GPT because there was this gap. So what happened was there was a peak of inflation, I mean, expectations from Galactica. It failed, it started hallucinating and started saying a bunch of uh, stuff that was really uh, politically problematic. And the the disillusionment with it re was, was reached really quickly. And the moment the product was pulled out of the market, there were these early adopters and these champions of the product who were left uh, without a competing product. Right? And it was at that point that ChatGPT came in as the reasonable uh, solution. And I think that is one reason why it reached a sort of, it somehow bypassed uh, a lot of the challenges that Galactica had, and it reached a sort of a acceptance that was just not there for Galactica. Uh, and that's a good example of how the S-curve played out uh, very recently and just over a period of a few days. Uh, but what, what is the problem with these frameworks? So while Gartner is rooted in the S-curve, right, uh, the way they have placed some of these items. So if I go back to, for example, uh, if I go back to this particular slide in 2021, they have a number of words here, which I don't even know if they exist. So for example, uh, data fabric, right? They mentioned this and it's going to happen something five to 10 years later. It's still not very clear what the term is. Uh, and there's something called real-time incident center as a service. Uh, I have still not heard of anything like this. Uh, and I don't know what it means, to be honest. Uh, and there's something called a sovereign cloud and a physics-informed AI. Uh, and the terminology has probably changed. I don't know. But but certainly in the sector, I have not come across these terms as commonplace or someone using this uh, and uh, or even talking about this. So... These were these were some very arbitrary things that have been placed at different parts of this curve, making an assessment as to where it is, how long it's going to take. As you can see, they made mistakes, and that's happened, right? So that those are some of the challenges. So the problem is first is these frameworks and these assessments they exist in isolation to pre-existing theory. So Gartner, at least, uh, I, I think it's a good case. Like they they use the S curve, and it is rooted in in some kind of science. But a lot of other people do publish uh, these kind of frameworks where they make these predictions, and they're completely isolated from pre-existing theory. But another problem with trying to use these kind of frameworks is they're too high level and they are not rooted in, in anything. They're rooted in the opinion of, uh, of consensus rather than, uh, rather than something tangible, right? So, and, and even the terminology, right? As you might've noticed the terms that are used there, they're, ter they're grounded in business jargon, linguistic terms, and there is a lot of innate hype in the terminology that is used as well, right? So uh, th that is one of the problems of using some of these frameworks to try and understand what's, what's happening with these with these pieces of tech. Uh, and so we're going to return back to the enterprise situation. So while we had that segue. So we now know that with the, the chat GPT era, like the arrival of chat GPT solves a bunch of things. So we, we are now able to see a lot of visible value. We're able to see people take stuff to production. We're able to see people build apps. It's happening really quickly. Like a lot of enabling infrastructure is happening. Uh, we are also able to see that there are, for companies, it's easier to create a boundary for using these open AI or, or hugging face or any of these models, it's easier for them to create a closed boundary and say, okay, you want to experiment, go ahead and do this experiment with these few models that you have uh, and essentially and restrict that space. Whereas in the past, analytics engagements would require some people to go to data, data science. And be, I mean, a lot of departments had to get involved. Right? Now it's a lot easier, a lot quicker. Uh, and there is also a greater deal of enterprise readiness. So a lot of people are finding it easier to work with with chat GPT, with AI, and it's the the bar to entry has become a lot lower and that's allowed a lot of normal people to enter it. Uh, and consequently, you can also see a lot of amazing development that's happening in the sector. So people are aware that there are plugins, people are aware that there are there are there is impact of bad quality data. Uh, and we are also seeing real capabilities emerge at the practical level within the enterprises. So people have now moved beyond using linear regressions for everything. So people in the past used to predict everything with a linear regression, a curve that says, okay, I'm going to focus the next thing. And we've moved past that. We're starting to see uh, deployments that are a little more advanced using a little more better math and better logic of the data sets and stuff. Uh, and you're also starting to see less analytics and more AI. So AI is coming in and you're able to see interpretations. You're able to see a bunch of things happening there. Uh, you're also starting to find that people have, are suffering from a visualization and a dashboard overload. So 
AI is stepping in there again. So people are, and they're using it as agents. They're using AI to explain what is going on, tell them what is happening, tell me the action. I don't want to, I don't want to listen to all this. I don't want to understand all this. Just tell me what to do next. So that's, that's really something that's helping people. Uh, and it's also creating this whole area of data engineering as a real capability. People are able to see, okay, which part of data engineering is valuable and which part is not. And that is emerging. And hard decisions are getting made consequently uh, because of this. Uh, and now there's, there is, there is the stuff that this newly enables. So pre chat GPT. So you have new experiences that are enabled by using the new GPT era tools, right? Uh, and you have new paradigm shifts. So we are now in an era of vectors, embeddings, and there is things around knowledge graphs, graph networks. Uh, there is a lot of talk around custom LLMs, large language models, small language models, deploying custom LLMs. Uh, and there's also a lot of uh, talk around evaluating human being uh, AI and human plus AI and trying to see which of the three, how do these work? There's a lot of that focus that is happening there. The new roles that are emerging, as I said, uh, and you have fundamental business reengineering that is going on, a lot of potential there uh, that is happening and emerging with time. And you you have already seen new markets emerge uh, in this particular era. So you're seeing people pay for custom plugins, custom models, people are paying for data applications, prompts, people are just even playing for like prompts or just tell me like images, outputs. So people are paying for all kinds of things that they were not paying for uh, a year and a half ago. And that's 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 visible and, and we can see it. Uh, but what remains uns unresolved, like I said, career development, right? The career development of people now in, in this world, completely unknown. Like, it, it, and we definitely need to do work uh, to define this better and, and, and understand this a lot better. Uh, and I also think the technology, there's a lot of areas in the technology space that are still unresolved and, uh, and we should be clear which parts of it are, are resolved and which parts are not. There's a lot which is unresolved for an enterprise readiness level, like for POCs, for demonstrations, there's a lot that's really nice, but for putting this in production, many things are still not resolved. Uh, and again, managing the talent that people have. So while these roles get defined, keeping them and, and attracting them, retaining them, that's going to be a unique challenge, right? And people need to understand that. A uh, lot of lot of things that don't remain clear is financial controls. So there's a lot of different moving parts. How do you assess costs? How do you create new architectures? Uh, that's not clear. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in the long tail. So people using AI and people using it for malicious reasons or in creative ways that are unexpected. Uh, you have a lot of things that are unresolved. So things like copyright, what is the legal situation? What do we do with bad actors? And the social instability problem that might be posed by the arrival of this technology. These things are still unknown, and these long term risks that we don't know. And there are other things. Uh, what is the, going to be the future of prompt engineering? Is it going to even exist in a couple of years? Uh, whether data is as important as it was before, or is it like, is it is it is it hype? Is it not? That is an unresolved question, and it's a fundamental question that we have to still answer. Uh, and stakeholder misalignments. So as, as once you have a technology that's far ahead of the uh, of the general population, you're going to see different levels of expertise, and there's going to be a huge struggle if there is expertise mismatch uh, in in different layers, and that's going to percolate down across uh, across society. So, I know that this is an active research topic in several universities, but it does have profound systemic la landscape implications if people, if the stakeholders don't understand this clearly. Uh, so, yeah, what are just the basic? Quickly clarify for all of the researchers listening to. You take each and every one of those unclear or unresolved points as a potential area for you to jump into. And these, these are by no means comprehensive. There's a lot of great uh, research, again, that details out and documents a bunch of these areas where emerging research is required. Uh, and people are publishing a lot of this, this stuff uh, and it's available in, in different journals and different preprint servers. So lots of lots of things are happening. Now, but that that comes down to the point, right? While all of this is happening, where do we start? Right? Because so much is happening at so many different layers that you have to start somewhere to see what is economically going to be impactful and what is not. And I figured that the axiomatic place to start is best served by starting at the algorithmic level. So if we are able to start at the most foundational thing, which is the algorithm, and if we are able to think of how the algorithm drives all of these changes, it's probably easier for us to predict how the algorithms might drive future changes. Uh, because we are limited by that and we're also limited by other things but the algorithm is a starting point uh, and i ended up stumbling upon this one framework which i which i started so this is one of the first frameworks that 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 basically got me thinking uh, around okay there's improvements in science and i've seen that technology re results in economic opportunity but how does this all connect together and 
uh, there was there was this really cool framework uh, that was proposed in the 1980s by a couple of Stanford uh, authors, right? So one was an economist, uh, Nathan Rosenberg, and uh, Roy was uh, another engineer who was, who was basically working in Stanford at that point in time. And they proposed this framework where they said something really simple, right? The, the simplicity of it is when there is a fundamental change in the science, uh, that's going to eventually translate into some kind of technological application. Uh, and that technological application is going to create some kind of an economic shift. And the economic shift is going to have a policy sort of response to this change. Uh, and that is going to now create a cycle. So essentially, whenever you have a change at a scientific level, you're going to have to, you're going to eventually see that cascade down and it's going to move through technology into economy and into policy. Why is this framework particularly relevant now? Is because these the, the transition is now getting shorter. So we now live in an era of information speed which was never there before 2000, right? Uh, so now we are in this area where information, like things going from a preprint in a research server to a product that people are paying for, the speed is now dramatically reduced because in, in at least in, the, in this particular sphere, not in many other spheres, but in AI and computing because of cloud and enabling infrastructure scale of these providers, uh, the speed is much faster. So you're going to see a shortening of this. And you're also you're already seeing this, like it's already happening. You're seeing preemptive regulation against AI, uh, and you're already seeing all of that emerge very quickly. Uh, even though the near the two changes have been only four or five years old, like six years old. Uh, so this this is the framework that I use when I look at uh, when I try to understand how something at a scientific level is going to eventually how is it going to how is it going to pan out. And this is a nice framework at a starting point. I just subscribe to it. I don't know if it is true or not, but it feels reasonable. Uh, and uh, it's not like a bad area to start. Of course, things inform each other. Policy changes create their own opportunities from economic land, uh, standpoint. Economic situations create technological opportunities. So there are. It's not like a one. It's not like a unidimensional flow. But uh, taking the larger view, this is what probably it is. Uh, and an example of this, right? Uh, so if you have to take an example of this, a very good example of this is like James Clark Maxwell, right? Like looking at the past. So Maxwell's equations are foundational to physics and he proposed this in, in the 1840s. It pretty much sets up the tone for all of modern physics. And uh, it was about uh, 30 to 40 years later that Hendrich, uh, that Hertz basically uh, would experiment to verify Maxwell's theory. So th his theory is not verified for almost uh, three to four decades and people don't think it can, uh, can, it can be verified. So Hertz experimentally discovers radio waves, and he he and he very very ironically Hertz basically says uh, that there is no use of this. So I just discovered this. It's this cute little thing, but I don't know if anyone is going to make any use of it. It's just a discovery, and he just went on to move on to do other things. But it was commercialized a few years later. So the science got commercialized into a technology. Marconi built on a number of technological advancements that had happened since Hertz's discovery, and then commercialized it into the radio. Right. And the radio would then become an instrumental part of public policy. So it was it was instrumental in the early decades of the 1900s, and pretty much many presidencies, many of the dictators of the world, all the wars, everything was fought uh, with the radio as one of the central parts of this this whole era of communication. So uh, it all starts with Maxwell, right? And it took almost a century before you could see applications of it emerge right at the policy level, right? So you you've seen this whole cycle play. It goes from science gets into the tech, the economic opportunities created, and the policy uh, implications uh, emerge. So other applications also piggyback on the radio. So you can also see that the cycle doesn't stop. So the science of uh, Maxwell continues to unleash innovation in other areas. So his foundational science, the application of it as we have understood it better, has resulted in improvements in the TV, satellite. We use Maxwell everywhere. Right? So that's pretty much uh, the story of how science results in changes fundamentally uh, around around the world so now with that i think this is the point where we go into the now the economics of the whole thing and uh, and and talk about what areas of economics are applicable when we want to talk about algorithms so so now we we look at what is an economic cycle right so the economic cycle like 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 i mentioned before you have a period of expansion then the uh, there's a peak then you have a period of recession or a deflation and then again, you see another rise. And this is a repeated cycle that you see uh, over the last century and possibly more. Uh, and it is an area of debate. So whether these things exist or not. And some people say it does exist. It's a real thing. 
and some people dispute that it exists and it's just accidental because we just have 100, 200 years of data and we can't make a serious claim because as an industrial society, we are really young. We have, we, we are just uh, not more than 200 years old as, a, as an industrial society, right? And, uh, and that's a very limited data point. Like we have very little data for just 200 years, 192 different countries today and other countries that have come and gone. So there's a lot of challenges in being able to get that and say that this is good enough for us to make an informed decision. But there are respected economists at both ends. And a prominent example of someone who, who buys and, and who, who pushes the theory of business cycles is uh, Ray Dalio. And he's written a bunch of books on this. And, and he's really famous about, uh, and he's been an investor who subscribes to the idea of economic cycles. Uh, but then you also have another very respected economist who disagrees, and that's Gregory Mankiw. So his uh, book on economics at Harvard is is, is a book I, I have recommended for many years. It's a great book. Uh, it, it, it really explains uh, macroeconomic theory very, very simply. And he argued that these cycles are fictional, that we are just superimposing uh, some sort of anthropological meaning to random events. So, uh, and that basically these fluctuations are unpredictable. Like, uh, so his point was that these are just fictional. Uh, but we are going to proceed under the reasonable assumption that they exist because we have seen that the science, we started the science, there's definitely changes unleashed by science. And, and we, we can see that we have enough data when we look at the science, we have more data than looking at broad GDP statistics uh, to determine how cycles emerge. Uh, so this, the history of thinking about these things as cycles uh, basically began with this guy called Jean-Charles uh, Sismondi. And he was a, he was a French economist. Uh, and uh, essentially, he, he was unique for his era. The reason being that uh, at his time, classical economics of his period had always uh, understood the world of economics only through the lens of war. Because the feudal age was always about people gaining wealth or losing wealth through war. So uh, soldiers would go plunder, the wealth would go come back uh, to, to, the, to the country. So a lot of cases of economic transformation pre-industrial world was driven by exchange through war. Uh, and that was one of the big reasons for uh, not thinking too much about economic cycles. And they always used to think that all of these economics of the world are driven by war. Uh, but Sismondi was the first person to propose a very radical concept for that era, which was basically that an economic cycle can just result from overproduction and underconsumption, with ideas that we take for granted in this in this last 90 years of peace, uh, but which are not particularly popular if you take the larger scheme of economics. So uh, in his time when he proposed it, it was a radical idea and people dismissed it at the start, but he was really lucky because exactly five years or 10 years after he proposed this theory and he was laughed out, uh, as uh, someone who was just proposing something out of the blue, uh, he there was something called the Panic of 1825. Now, this is a really significant event in the history of financial cycles. And the reason for it is because uh, it, it was the first financial crisis to have ever occurred in peacetime. So every other financial crisis that happened before 1825 had an, under, an, an undercurrent of war that was connected to it. So, so even though people have a lot, of, lot more sensational examples, like the tulip mania, and they talk about a bunch of other crises, uh, the truth is there is still an, under, an undercurrent of war. There's an undercurrent of a bunch of other factors there, which, which may or may not make complete sense to us from this distance. But the 1825 panic was really interesting because it happened in a very interesting period. So the Napoleonic Wars had just been settled uh, between England and France, and uh, England had basically suspended the gold standard to fund the wars at that point in time. So like modern eras, the currency was not backed by gold. It had a free float. And so there was a lot more currency. And what was really interesting back then was the Bank of England was not a central bank. It was a for-profit entity. It was not the lender of la last resort, like how you see the, the Federal Reserve today or, or the Bank of England or many of the central banks. They are not seen as lenders of last resort. They are more seen, they were more interested in uh, working for the benefit of their stakeholders and their shareholders, which was the government, common, normal people. Uh, and so they basically, when the, when the crisis hit, and normally when a, when a financial crisis hits, the, the current Keynesian economics of the world is to provide stimulus and uh, to try and basically get the economies to weather that period. But this was not the era where that happened. So they, when, when a crisis hit, their response was to protect capital. And the traditional thinking around protecting capital is risk-adjusted rate of return, right? So to adjust for the greater risk of an economic crisis, you now need to charge a higher rate of return to protect your investment, right? And that was contrary to our modern central banking uh, thinking that emerged in that era, right? There was also another more 
popular anecdotal story there was, there was a it supposedly held that the crisis was precipitated by something called the poya scream so there was this uh, famous swindler called gregor general gregor mcgregor and uh, it was a discovery of south america at that point in time where people were looking at it as an opportunity people were investing in uh, the colonies that were newly being built in south america so he created a fictional country called poyas and he asked people to invest into it and he ended up getting a bunch of huge very famous investors to invest into it and when they realized that poyas was not a real country the whole scheme collapsed and in the process many banks uh, basically got closed there was a lot of things that happened but the key point was that whole crisis was actually caused due to oversupply of capital after the napoleonic wars the withdrawal of capital because these guys went back to the gold standard and that was simply under consumption and overproduction right so in first case overproduction in the second case underproduction and that precipitated this economic crisis unrelated to war this is the foundation of thinking about economic crisis so ever since then uh sismondi just uh, real quick to comment on that i think uh, an important parallel to draw with you know more current events is with what happened with ftx um and SBB, right the i think the the cycle of paid attention to the signs are if there is an economic crisis in a time of peace where there's an oversupply of financing and people are indiscriminately investing in x y or z right whether that's in crypto whether that's in generative ai whatever is of high at the moment um i think it's a it's a red flag for investors to, to pay attention stop and think for a second why is there so much capital being moved where why is there such an influx of capital right did that stem from us being in a time of peace and therefore there's so much capital that people are more indiscriminate and that kind of leads to a Group think, or more likely, group think type mentality, where if an investor, um, even if they're well respected or a bank uh, that's very reputable, is now investing in these much more risky uh, things, and other people have capital that is much more um, expendable, and they start following suit, that that can create that wave, that hype, and then a lot of people get burned because it's not actually because the the technology itself will eventually meet its its demand or um, its hype, but that because the product of the time, um, those mistakes can be made. Absolutely. I think uh, you overbuy for an asset uh, that that you expect to appreciate much more than, than it actually does. So realistically, I mean, it's not, think about it this way, right? Let's say I, I know that an asset is worth $100 uh 10 years from now and uh i get an opportunity to pay for it uh and i would ideally like to pay ten dollars for it let's say i just want to sp spend ten dollars for it and get a approximate eight time return on my investment in 10 years so i'm looking at a very different sort of return right so my my cagr that i'm looking at when i and, and then I, I do a risk adjusted rate of return and things like that but let's just say broad strokes let's talk about what would be my compound interest right I'm tripling my money. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm doubling my money price in ten years. So every three years, approximately once, I double my money. So which means I'm getting approximately twenty four percent return on my investment uh, every year. Uh, but if I end up spending, uh, if my current bank interest rate is is ten percent, let's say, and I end up paying uh, and valuing this thing at forty when it's going to be a hundred after, uh, I'm I'm hoping that it's going to have to grow a lot more than it does. And my actual rate of return is going to temper down a lot. So you're just, you're timing the market and you're investing the capital at the wrong time, I think. So it's always about looking at your risk adjusted rate of return that you're expecting. And uh, that, that risk point, valuing that risk, I think is really important uh, in, in these situations. So knowing that that's pretty much why I always say you need to know what is driving the cycle. And in, in, in this particular case with AI, uh, knowing the tech is critical. I think without knowing the tech, uh, it's going to be very difficult to uh, to make anything other than a a sort of macro judgment and not not particularly informed on the details. Uh, so I think that's that's uh, that's the overall situation. I think, in my opinion, yeah, a lot uh, of extrapolation that for people who don't understand the technical side is probably vastly overestimated. I don't know if it's vastly overestimated. Like I said, there are opportunities and, and there, there, it's always about uh, looking at 
your horizon for getting your capital, right? So people, you can invest in something that is going to be, that is going to go down to zero, uh, but you can invest and get in at the right time and get out at the right time. So it's always, there's a lot of things that go into making this money. It's about your time investment, your horizon. But most of what I am talking about is is more geared towards someone who takes a more longer term view on, on these things. So uh, that would probably be the benefit of looking at these economic cycles because these uh, cycles have been identified with certain different levels of periodicity. And you're going to see those periodicities play out no matter what overall is happening. So going back to the first point, right, of the original economic cycle, the first cycle that got really proposed uh, and is related to investments themselves was by Clement Juglar, right? So Juglar uh, is basically proposed, he was another French, uh, he, he picked up from Sismondi's work and uh, and Schumpeter, the, the great Austrian economist of this, of this last century for entrepreneurs, he essentially called it a juggler cycle in his honor, right? So what he says is it goes like this. So you, you start off with a period of prosperity. And I'm, I picked this up from one of the old research papers uh, that talks about the business cycle. But it starts off with, uh, first of all, I think the low interest rate regime. So you're going to have a, a, a regime where bank interest rates are low. And that's usually the, the, the precursor to an expansion. So when interest when capital is cheap, people are going to borrow. And uh, because people are going to borrow, that is going to generate economic value. And you're going to see increase in production and consequently also price because the interest rates will slowly start to rise. And as the interest rates start to rise, the repayments go higher. And because repayments get higher, the cost of goods start to rise uh, as a consequence. So businesses need to charge more. Uh, and then what happens is eventually you're going to see a period of crisis. So uh, there's going to be a point where the consumer is unable to pay. And there is going to be a point where the producer is unable to pay to retain his workforce. So it's going to create this cycle where you're going to reach a crisis point where things happen, right? And multiple bankruptcies happen, people are unable to pay. And immediately that results in a recession. So the moment people start losing jobs, you're going to see drops in prices. You're going to see drops in output. Uh, and you're also going to see for a brief period, an intervening period, a period of high interest rates, because that would come at the time of the crisis uh, during, the, uh, during the period where everything is high. Uh, and once they cut the price rates, you're going to again see recovery because eventually banks have to get to a point where they have to stoke the economy. And if there is a lot of pain, they will have to get back to a regime where they'll have to cut interest rates. And that's again going to create a favorable environment for borrowing more capital. So he created this fixed investment cycle and he predicted and he analyzed and he saw for the data of his era, he, he said that uh, it is likely that these things emerge with a 7 to 11 year periodicity. So this was the first uh, proper cycle that was proposed and and it was not taken up uh, far too seriously. I mean, it was not, it, it took a while before it really ca captured the imagination. So Schumpeter primarily who who brought a lot of uh, focus to Jogla's work. But then you then had another uh, interesting cycle that was uh, again, uh, that was discovered. Uh, this happened in the 1920s. There's a much smaller cycle, uh, about every 40 months. And what was really interesting about the cycle is uh, research over, over the last 20 years or 30 years has identified that even if you know what is going to be the future price of uh, a given commodity, you're still going to have market inefficiencies. So a perfect market could never exist. And the, and the best example of this was something called the pork cycle and the beef cycle. So uh, these are well-studied cycles where every year we know that there are farmers who are livestock uh, livestock managers who who see a demand, let's say for beef. And so they hire a bunch of cattle. And uh, once they have a bunch of cattle, the cattle matures and now they're now supplying it into the market. Suddenly there's a glut because there's an oversupply of cattle in the market. And demand collapses because now people are not buying. And so the people who are having these cows cut back and suddenly there's an undersupply in the market. And again, the cycle repeats. And what is really interesting is they have noticed that there is a periodicity to this every 40 months uh, around the world that, that it happens that these livestock markets have these repeated cycles. And what was even more interesting is knowing this did not help people make uh, better predictions. Like even if you had perfect information, economic theory uh, indicates that the inefficiency of the market is simply because of the cycle having to play out. And this is really interesting because it says that cycles can exist independent of uh, actual events. Right? And, and this is, again, probably evidence to say that these do exist. Uh, and this is, again, an illustration of how 
this works. So you're going to see this period where inventory is low. You're going to see uh, an increasing output when inventory is low. And as a result of increasing output, you're going to see more orders. And because of more orders, the people in the factory, their incomes rise. You're going to see even more demand. And now in anticipation of future demand, you're going to see capital investment at the peak of that investment cycle. And that immediately is going to see that the return on that capital is not going to happen. You're going to have the sales growth not growing as much as the capital expects. You're going to see the investments contract and you're going to see decline in output. So this is a repeated cycle that we notice uh, and the kitchen cycle basically illustrates this. Uh, and again, it has this the stages of the kitchen cycle, quite similar to what Jugla presented, but he just has a little more stages. Uh, and uh, But we can go into the next, next phase of this, right? So which is more about uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, now, Simon Kuznets is, was a Nobel-winning economist, and uh, his work, again, uh, informs what is called the Kuznets swings or the Kuznets cycles. So he actually ended up studying, at that point in time, a very interesting phenomenon. So he was looking at building rates or so construction in a, in a particular city, in Chicago, I think. And he was studying the rate of construction and, and correlating it with the arrival of migrants. So uh, whether the arrival of immigrants uh, changed the level of construction intensity uh, within the city. And this was the first time he had undertaken something like this, where he took an urban demography problem and connected it to a business cycle and an economic problem. So he took urban mobility, urban demography as an area of study, and this is an area of urban geography, connected it to economics. So that's why that study is pretty, pretty important uh, from a discipline perspective. And he saw that there are economic waves, uh, again, where he saw that there are there, there is a periodicity to them. So he said 15 to 25 years. And this has been investigated. And essentially, uh, with this investigation, there, there is evidence to indicate that, yes, these exist. But they are probably part of a larger curve. And uh, they're like a harmonic part of a larger curve. Uh, so coming to that, we come to the most important mind of uh, technological cycles, right? Who's this guy called Kondratiev, who was a Soviet economist. Uh, and essentially... A, a, a remarkable man. Uh, so, uh, essentially, before we, we we get into what Kondratiev did, I just want to quickly just show you uh, the history of technology, right? Uh, as as we see it now. So this was this was published. I picked this up from uh, a post that had been shared uh, by Oxford. And this basically, if you notice, when we when we talk about timeline of humanity, timeline of our evolution, and a bunch of things, uh, nowadays we are taking a more technocentric view of how we evolved as a species. So we we attribute our evolution more to technology, whereas in the past, history was more written from a personality standpoint. Right? So this king did this, that king did that, as a result of which something has happened. But now you're seeing this technocentrism that's coming to uh, history. And the big reason for this is Kondratiev. So uh, Kondratiev uh, basically was this remarkable man. He, he was in the, he was in the early 30s, uh, he ended up publishing a series of, of studies uh, analyzing agricultural statistics uh, for a number of countries. And he was also a Soviet statistician. Uh, and he was actually sent to the Gulag. So he was imprisoned in the Gulag, uh, even though he was just a statistics professor. He was imprisoned, but he continued to write, even though his health was deteriorating. And uh, and he spent the rest of his life in in basically the Gulag. But uh, he kept publishing as much as he could, and towards the end, of course, uh, he had a very unfortunate end. But thankfully, we still recognize the genius that the man was, and he he basically came up with a number of theses, uh, which which is still quite revolutionary if you think about it from the time that he was talking about. And uh, the, the the key point in his theory is the third point, where he says that major technological innovations were conceived in downswing periods. They were conceived when things were bad. But when the market turns and when the market essentially gets the legs for for capital, the they they get this boost uh, when this opportunity exists. So when a technological innovation is conceived, is waiting for capital, and there is this downswing period where it is uh, waiting, for, the 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 opportunity for it emerges uh, with an extraordinary force when the cycle turns, and when you have a reversal. So those become the areas where the highest amount of growth is felt. And this was an idea that when Kondratiev proposed it, it was pretty radical for his time. So uh, he then essentially came up with this idea where he said, you have long cycles uh, of about 50 years. Uh, at the beginning of every cycle, 
and all of it is driven by technology, right? So the K wave, we call these K waves in his honor. It's all driven by technology. And he says, at the start, you're, you're producing these high cost capital goods uh, and you're producing, uh, you're, you're creating these big infrastructure investments. Uh, but after a few decades, like when you have these massive infrastructure investments and stuff, the expected return is going to fall below the uh, capital rate. So you're going to have a rate of capital and you're going to get a return from these infrastructure investments. It's going to be less than the capital rate. So people are going to refuse to invest. And this overcapacity is now going to result in layoffs and you're going to have result reduced demand. And again, the same cycle as before, right? You're going to see unemployment, you're going to see economic crisis, and people are going to save up their resources until confidence returns. And then you're going to see the growth of the cycle. So nothing very different from that aspect, but connecting it to the tech was what was his major contribution. So he saw technology as the driver. So before it was underconsumption, overproduction, it was a bunch of other things. Kondratiev put tech as the driver right at the center. And he said, uh, cyclical progress is attributable just to changes at the technology level. So now combining this uh, with everything that we have, we we had this person who came and formalized it for us. So Schumpeter, like I said, the the probably the greatest economist to focus on entrepreneurship uh, in the last 100 years. Uh, he essentially celebrated the whole idea of creative destruction. He welcomed uh, the contrariety of cycles beginning. He spoke about how innovation and technology is is a force of destroying things in order to create the ground for these extraordinary capital returns when, when the capital shifts. And he proposed the business cycle theory. He proposed the innovation cycle theory. And it is pr pretty much his work that we uh, somehow still refer to in, in, in a lot of meaningful ways. right? And what was his most, most interesting thesis was he combined everything. So he took the kitchen cycle, the juggler cycle, the Kuznets wave, the Kondratiev waves. He took all of these different waves, different periodicities. So kitchen, 40 months, Jugla cycles, 8 to 11 years, Kuznets cycles, 15 to 25 years, Kondratiev cycles, 50 to 70 years. He superimposed all of them and proposed a curve that looks like this. So you have a scenario where you have all of these cycles playing out at different phases of the uh, uh, that, are, that are overlapping, interplaying. And it's pretty much Ray Dalio's theory as well. So if you break down his theory to the essentials, you can summarize it in something like this, where, where you have all of these curves that are superimposed on each other, they're playing with each other, and you're going to see changes because of them. But this big giant curve that you see, the big one, that is Kondratiev. And that is the one that is most important, at least uh, from my perspective, when we talk about how algorithms change things. Uh, so uh, is all of this theoretical, right? Like, And the truth is, we have seen waves of innovation uh, over the last several decades. And there have been, uh, we have noticed that the 1700s, we have this first wave, we have a second wave in the, 18, in the 1850s that keeps going on. We're going to see more and more waves. And we notice a periodicity, like every 50 years, 60 years, we're seeing something change, right? And something uh, quite phenomenal happen in a meaningful sense. So uh, that's the whole idea. And how do we connect this to even capital market returns? And this was, again, a study that was done uh, by a, a couple of people. Uh, and this the source is, again, available. Uh, and essentially, they, they superimpose the Kondratiev wave on the 10-year uh, rolling yield of the S&P 500. And it is really interesting to notice that the yield mimics the curve. Uh, and essentially, knowing this is, again, I don't know if information asymmetry is going to resolve anything from an actionable standpoint, but this is uh, evidence that there is a pattern. And uh, it probably does make sense for us to at least look at this pattern and, and, and have an assessment as to whether uh, we can apply it or not. Uh, according to this particular data, we're supposed to be in that uh, the sixth quadrati of cycle, right? So it's already supposed to have begun. We are now in in like it has begun since 2010, and we are now seeing the next wave of about 40 to 50 years play out. Uh, but evidence is tilted, right? So everybody disagrees on the timing of these curves or the length of these uh, cycles. Uh, but the evidence is out there, right? So uh, what have been the improvements since Schumpeter? So Schumpeter was obviously not the last person to to identify this a lot better. Uh, so now we just know that there are a lot more cycles. So we've identified uh, another cycle called the seculum or the century wave, but it's it's more related to geopolitical rivalries and larger conflicts. But the Kondratiev wave is still a big part of everyone's analysis. Uh, and there is also the belief that you have long period human activity waves. And if you notice, 
this is the current theory and all of these elements are driven by technology so the moment we're able to work with stone the moment we're able to work with fire we are converting everything of our history into a sort of technological view of human progress right and that is really important for us because if we adopt that view then the future is also going to be technologically driven future so if we say our history is going to be technologically driven history it automatically implies that the future is going to be technologically driven so if that means that the economic theories that are related to tech are going to take prominence if we become a more technocratic world uh, i hope that makes sense yeah so i'm going to think... pause and uh, i I'm, I'm probably uh, ask you whether it's worthwhile looking at some of these algorithms themselves and seeing how these apply or what what direction do you want this talk yeah so what i'd like to do also is to now that we've gone through the, the whole history, put it all together in the minds of entrepreneurs, investors, researchers, and activists, right? So in that first phase where the technology is being um, developed or there's research happening um, or some scientific uh, discovery, uh, that is primarily for the researchers, listening, right? And so um, based on these cycles, what should they be paying attention to? What should they be researching or focusing on? And then we can move to the next step. I think uh, research should always be driven by the researcher's interest. Uh, discovery is always best made when interest drives it. So I think if researchers are able to identify a problem uh, and go into it, they would be they would be contributing to society in the most profound way. They were they were being given the responsibility on all our behalfs to drive science and which is with an open mind so from my perspective whenever they make a discovery in science and, and this is a re repeated pattern we see in scientific discovery over the last uh, 100 200 years that many people are not able to fully comprehend the impact of their uh, of their scientific of their scientific proposal a very very good example of this is just this whole gpt era right so the word gpt is general purpose transformer right the word transformer uh, comes from a paper in 2017 uh, by Vaswani uh, and, and co. The architecture that they used was to solve a translation problem. It was nothing more than translating, translating one sentence into another, right? Uh, from one language to another. It was a very simple problem that, uh, from today's perspective, like it'll, it'll sound like a very simple problem. Like, why is this a big deal, right? Uh, and they did not anticipate that that particular transformer architecture that they proposed would become so foundational that uh, it would become the bedrock of GPTs. Uh, it would become the bedrock of a lot of current architecture. And I also don't believe that this architecture is the end. So there's already now competing architectures uh, in the marketplace that are there in the research domain, uh, which we know is a superior alternative to current transformer architecture. And it is not going to be improbable to expect that people will be building something with it. And they will be building a new type of large language model with it, which will have different capabilities. Now, how radical are those capabilities? We don't know. Because that is really important to know about these current models, right? Many of the capabilities we have found in them are actually in that word, in that sense, the right word. We have found them. They are, they are emergent capabilities. We never expected to find them. We just discovered them as we ended up working with larger and larger models. Uh, so it's conceivable to think that as we change our fundamental approach at the algorithm level, you're going to see new capabilities that we probably have not anticipated. Uh, and we should probably have an open mind to welcome them when, when they do arrive and investigate them when they do emerge. So it's kind of interesting to see this simultaneous discovery, both on the theoretical side from researchers in terms of imagined scenarios, right? Of what could happen, what would people eventually desire? What are some of the ways that we could imagine these algorithms improving? And then there's also on the technological um, engineering side of what is actually possible from a technological perspective and what do those possibilities say about what will actually be adopted or not? Um, so moving from, from there to the next step where we have this innovation with the technology actually being implemented in some cases for entrepreneurs or for engineers, um, what are the questions that they should be asking themselves? What should they be focusing on based on these cycles? I think uh, 
I think different sets of people have asked different questions uh, of this particular tech. Uh, I think if it comes to investors, uh, the honest answer for me is I think they should know what is the part of it that is actually AI and what is the part of it that is engineering. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of investments where the product is not AI, but rather it leverages AI in in specific features. Uh, rather, the core value offering of that product is not necessarily driven by AI. It is driven by something else. I think uh, investors are better off looking at the business model that they are buying uh, rather than the technological capability that is being bought. Uh, so that is one. But again, there are investors who invest also in specific technological capabilities, and that's a separate topic. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking broadly. Broadly speaking, if investors are buying into something, someone who is selling AI to them, uh, I think the question that they should really be asking is, uh, is AI a core functionality or is it a feature of this particular value proposition? Uh, I also think they should they should be able to correctly demarcate uh, which part of it is actually proprietary and which part of it is not, uh, and which parts of it are uh, protectable and which parts. So a lot of moats. Uh, a lot of interesting modes will emerge within businesses uh, because of this these new capabilities. And a lot of interesting new business models will also emerge. So for uh, many many investors, I think being aware and savvy enough to recognize where these markets are emerging and usually is a sign of where the markets will eventually mature. So TikTok was uh, like wine, right? Wine was a product that was popular in 2014. The, the the product died, but the format lived. And now you have TikTok, which is a global phenomenon, right? about nine years later. Uh, so it's the same in, in this particular case. So a lot of the things that we have now may not live in the same shape and form, but, uh, but the core ideas that drive them will continue to exist. Uh, so I, I think that part is something that investors should understand a lot clearer. Like, what are they actually buying? Are, are they buying the value proposition in the tech or are they buying the business model? And knowing to... To separate what what part of it is proprietary, what part of it is not, knowing what part of it is core engineering and what part of it is uh, like software engineering and what part of it is AI related engineering, that's something that they should know better. I mean, they should investigate a little deeper. Uh, for entrepreneurs, I think I, I honestly think we are nowhere near the start. There is uh, we have not scratched the surface of what is possible and the kind of business models that will emerge. Uh, uh, because it is a very dynamic space. It is an extremely dynamic space. And uh, the truth is, even entrenched players uh, within the AI services space or uh, within the AI sector, they are going to see themselves having to navigate a landscape which is not very well known. There's lots of things that are happening right now where people are reacting. And it's difficult to forecast how uh, how these things will change, right? So that that automatically means that there is opportunity for entrepreneurs and it automatically means that the 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 giants while they move slowly the nimble people will move a lot faster under their feet uh, so i think there are lots of valuable areas lots of valuable niches markets uh, and a lot of valuable product areas experiences there's so many areas in which you can add, add you can use ai as a moat as a real moat to, to generate like value that uh, you are only limited by your imagination. And I think it will take, uh, you, you are only limited by your imagination. I think that the honest truth is that. Uh, so for entrepreneurs, I think the golden age of AI is not here. Even though people say it is, uh, I do believe that, I don't know when it will appear, but we are nowhere near. Like my, my expectation from AI is a lot more than where it currently stands. Uh, and that basically if I am able to visualize this and I'm fairly, I'm not by any means one of the most sophisticated people in the sector, but if I'm able to visualize how, how much change is, is readily apparent uh, by doing the things the right way, then it's just obvious that uh, people much smarter than me are going to figure out way better things than, than, than what we currently have. So, uh, and that's going to create economic opportunity. So for entrepreneurs, my point for them is, this is the sector. Uh, this is a field where it is worth learning. It's worth getting digging deep. It's worth getting your hands dirty. It's worth failing because the payoff is high. You can have three or four failures, five failures, 10 failures, 
but the economics of getting it right are so incredible that you can have 10 failures you just need one big success to overpower everything uh, and the the math is the math is like that in this particular case yeah so um i'll let you decide if, if this is uh relevant to dive into more with the application to algorithms but to summarize that point, I think that there's a couple of really important uh, lessons in there for entrepreneurs and investors to keep in mind. The first is uh, maybe it is um, more important in a way for the innovators and the researchers to think about what are the fundamental things about humans uh, that will always be true? And are, what are the ways that those needs that we have will change as we move through these technological innovations. And then to think about these different cycles as a means of timing when you should make that certain innovation or launch that product or invest in that startup that is now capitalizing on a new better way of serving a fundamental need that will remain constant throughout humanity, right? So even just thinking about it on like Maslow's hierarchy, um, if there are products that, because of AI, will now emerge uh, faster, will be able to serve those needs better, um, and will be able to potentially disrupt existing larger players, that's a great opportunity for the researchers, the entrepreneurs, and the investors to capitalize on, and then eventually for the activists to see the fallout or the consequences of that adoption and uh, think about how to mitigate the downsides that come with it. Um, so there's uh, one of the first steps being the ideation based on constants and then the timing based on these cycles and um, whichever player you are, whether you're the researcher or an investor, um, and, and knowing your domain of expertise within that, uh, I think that would be a, a useful framework uh, to consider. Absolutely. Awesome. So, um, Armin, should we dive into these algorithms? We've got uh, another five minutes, um, and I do want to wrap up with some conclusion questions as well. Uh, so, how should uh, we? I think I think algorithms uh, are best served for maybe a different session, but uh, I think we should just close for now because I think, like I said, there's already a lot of information. Uh, just getting your head wrapped around some of the starting points to to basically consider, right? And yeah. Uh, I think if more sessions are needed, we and if there is interest, then yeah, we can obviously try and do something else like this later. Excellent. So, what would you say are your top three lessons that you want the researchers, entrepreneurs, investors, and activists to keep in mind moving forward? Uh, top three lessons. I think expect hope, disappointment, and uh, and unexpected results. Uh, I think that's always something that see, it's more likely than not that we're all going to be wrong uh, when it comes to predicting how this is going to shape out. It's it's very likely that we're we're all going to make mistakes. Uh, we're all going to be wrong, and uh, and I think our entire approach to this should be about hedging the downside. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more we proceed by hedging our downside and capping the downside risk, the more easy it is for us to adopt these things. So I am a big believer in the idea of uh, capping the downside. So investing in ethics, investing in safety, investing in in responsible AI, I don't see that as a, a, a hype. I see that as a fundamental way to mitigate downside risks. Uh, I also think the second lesson is not to underestimate how quickly things will move from research to economic impact. Uh, and it's going to get shorter. Uh, I don't foresee that the cycles in the past, of course, I think the Kondratiev cycle 50 years uh, was possible in the past because information took that much time to move, to, to transform, to change. But as we enter an era of greater capital availability in aggregate at a global level, I'm not talking about like individual countries, but in aggregate as capital increases and as uh, compute power increases as as uh, and number of people population will increase uh, i i do see that these things will 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 gain a force of their own right and 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 we should be uh, willing to anticipate a number of changes because of it it's going to it's going to happen so we should not underestimate how quickly these changes will arrive uh, at our end 
and we should also not probably overestimate them but i think i'm more leaning towards we should not underestimate them they will appear faster and uh they will not appear as fast as sometimes we might we might say they will but even 10 years or 20 years is really fast if you want to see like a world or society changing in 20 years is a very remarkable uh, time span if you take a historical sense and that's going to get smaller that's what i'm trying to say with with faster information easier uh, things and we have not seen we are nowhere near the beginning i can tell you that there are mega trends that will emerge uh, that will have to emerge over the next one two decades which will fundamentally alter how ai will be used so ar vr the day uh, wearables become commercialized and and we are able to actually wear something like a glass that gives us information in real time uh, without battery problems and without all of the mechanical problems that we have around this the moment it becomes an everyday item or even if it doesn't even if it becomes a regular item inside every home ai is going to leapfrog everything we are going to see a completely different world like our experiences of the world will change that will create a very different world as we know it uh, so there are going to be more hype cycles up ahead there, there are going to be things that are going to change dramatically up ahead uh, but we should be i think uh, welcoming those and the the worst way to do it is to become regressive about it uh, so i think the better way to, is to cap our downside and keep encouraging more innovation and so the more we cap our downside the more encouraging we will be of innovation uh, and that's that's what i would basically suggest uh, everybody uh, when they do this that they cap their downside awesome and i think you know um you've all heard a lot of talks about the five major innovations that really changed our world uh, but what's really interesting is sort of fire, discovery fire, the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, uh, internet. Um, I think also now another one will be either the singularity or meaning when um, artificial intelligence, general intelligence um, is around and usable and it is for the first time um, much, we've created something that's much smarter than the smartest human. Um, and it's very uh, rare, right, that there is there are people who may have been uh, alive during three of those societal changing um, innovations, right? And so there's so many opportunities for the entrepreneurs, the investors, the researchers, and the activists um, if you're alive now and paying attention to uh, how the Industrial Revolution changed uh, our societies most recently, how the internet has changed it, um, and then also how the singularity or leveraging AI um, where anybody can do or innovate in whichever way they want, where their imagination is the only limit uh, changing our societies for the future. So very exciting time. Uh, Arvin, I want to thank you so much for taking part in this interview. You shared so much value for our audience. Where can people get in touch with you and follow your work? Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn. Uh, that's unfortunately the only platform where I have time. Uh, but I wish I will try and do something about it this year, but uh, I mean, in the coming year. But uh, I'm available on LinkedIn and I would, uh, I'm more than happy to help if someone has any specific question on this talk or if they have awesome. anything else. All right. Well, thanks again for all of our listeners. Be sure to follow up with Arvind Iyer. Um, we will also make the slides from this presentation available for our listeners. We spent some months, spent months vetting these speakers because we knew they'd be really valuable to you. So definitely check them out and follow what they're up to. Since we're just starting out, we really use your support. If you like this content, please hit that like button, share this episode, comment, sign up for our newsletter, and share our episode with your friends and your favorite speakers so we can have them on. Tag us on your shared post to get exclusive perks like our member community deals on merch and early access to surprises. I promise we'll make it all worth it for you. Arvin, thank you so much for taking the time. It's just my name, Tim. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you.